A warm welcome for Greg, our last talk of the day, and then we will party. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, and thanks everybody for being here. So uh, yeah, let me turn my brightness up here so I can see what's going on. Hi, friends. It's good to see everybody here. It's the end of the day. I'll try not to make this too terribly long. Sensu 2.0. Uh, a lot of people are probably wondering or asking yourselves, what's happening? Didn't we just release 1.0 and 2.6.0? What is 2.0, et cetera? So, Sensu 2.0 is just kind of what we're calling the future of Sensu right now. Uh, I mean, I guess for Sensu Core, it will actually potentially be Sensu 2.0. Uh, it's, it's, it's exciting, sorry. I'm, I'm very excited right now. Uh, for the last six months, Sensu has been going through, like the company itself has been going through a lot of change. It incorporated, it expanded. I think Sean and I were talking about it last night. We went from seven to 18 people in six months. And that's uh, terrifying, so it's kind of cool. But at the same time, you know, pretty cool. Uh, and during those six months, we've been rewriting Sensu in Go. Before we talk about that, though, uh, I don't know everybody in this room, and I don't think everybody in this room knows me, so I want to talk about my favorite subject, me. <laughs> I'm Greg. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Sensu. And I'd like to kind of start with the story of how I came to Sensu uh, and how I fell in love with Sensu. I was introduced to Sensu in 2012 by my then manager, who had just kind of dropped it into production. Like, uh, to give you an idea of the level of in-production Sensu was at the time, when our TLS certs expired, we actually didn't have the cert like any of the certificate management stuff checked into source control. I was just like, I bet if I SSH to a Sensu server and CD into his home directory, there's like a shell script to regenerate the certs and put them into place, and that is literally how we got out of that mess uh, because it was there. So we had Xenos and Nagios in place uh, at the time, and we were we were moving from this very operations is doing all of the heavy lifting for everyone all the time world into more developer-centric self-service kind of reality, which was very exciting uh, to build at the time. We did, I got to do the initial deployment of Chef at, at this company. Uh, I got to really turn Sensu into the single way that all developers interacted with monitoring, alerting, and time series data. and. I mean, this was, uh, this was as cool as working with engineers, building Java client libraries to push things through the uh, agent uh, socket, like right port 3030 or whatever it is, and getting people into this idea of having metrics and having HTTP health check endpoints. And this was all stuff that nobody had really considered before. It was just, we had Nagios, it went out and it queried, you know, www.opower.com or whatever, and if it came back with anything but 200, it paged. And then it was like, okay, <laughs> what's broken? Uh, let's really try and figure out how to monitor things. So it, it was quite a journey. I worked with Sean, this is, this is Wizard Van. Uh, this was the inspiration for why we named it Wizard Van, I don't know why. Uh, but we were using, again, like the, the graphite uh, handler for Sensu, and it, we were seeing the fork problem and a, a few other things. Anyway, long story short, we ended up moving from this world where we had many ways of getting checks into a single graphite cluster into a centralized, standardized way of pushing metrics through our infrastructure uh, in a unified JSON format that just we, I mean, again, client library, Coda metrics. Nobody really knew that we were using Sensu to get anything anywhere. But I worked with Sean on this extensions API back in like 2012, 2013, because we needed, like we really needed better performance out of, uh, you know, routing metrics through Sensu. And that was, that for me was a sort of transitional period in my career where I actually did something with open source software that I had never really done before. I mean, a little bit, but not really, where I actually gave back 
Uh, and this is, uh, in my initial conversations with Caleb and Sean, we were talking about this idea uh, that has become the mission statement of Sensu, that we want people to build monitoring. Is if you think about what we do in our careers, we go from company to company and we do a lot of the same stuff over and over again. We all end up specializing in that one thing that just really gets us out of bed and gets us to work and, and gets us on the phone with a pager at three o'clock in the morning. And for me, that's, that's monitoring and, and infrastructure automation. And we want people to have a way to take this, this integral part of systems with them from one company to another as they move through their career. And for me, that common thread has always been Sensu. And that's a, it's, a, it's really exciting to, to now be here. I, I love Sensu. Uh, I, it just clicked for me when I first saw it, and it, it has really changed the way I think about software in general. First, back to Sensu 2.0. I, I would like to say don't panic. I will get this out of the way very quickly. A lot of people, when they ask about the rewrite and Golang, the very first question you get is, well, what about my checks? You don't have to rewrite any plugins. <laughs> we're, we're, the plugins continue to be Ruby. They could be whatever language you want to, right? The real interface to Sensu plugins is, again, this like Nagios-like uh, interface where you have common return codes. We capture the output. And this is really the check interface. Uh, we just happened to have built a community of check uh, contributors in Ruby. And Sensu is great because of that, right? Like, again, going back to this taking things from one place to another, we're all able to share in this common experience of building a monitoring platform together using a common framework in a common language. We don't want to invalidate any of that work during the rewrite. So we are very, 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 and I want to stress this as much as I can, committed to ensuring continuity in that community contribution and that community effort. So don't worry about your checks, your plugins. We are not trying to invalidate any of the very hard work that many people have done over the years to make Sensu as successful as it is. And now that I've sufficiently scared all of you, uh, let's talk about the question that I think is probably on at least some people's mind, why? <laughs> uh, my goal by the end of this talk is to get everybody here on board with this rewrite. Um, if you find that I haven't sufficiently convinced you uh, of anything that I talk about, please, by all means, come talk to me. Uh, come talk to Sean. We are super excited to be doing this work. We are very committed to it, and we really believe in it, and we think it's good for the community. So we are more than happy to talk about it. I mean, it's literally all we do. There's, uh, in, in researching this talk and, and writing this talk, I came across, across this idea from uh, a man named Martin Thompson, who around 2011 popularized the term mechanical sympathy. Uh, a distillation of this idea is that if you understand the underlying systems, if you understand the hardware that you are working on, you can actually write better, more performance software for that hardware. I mean, when you really think about it, it's a very simple idea. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you do it better, and it's easier. <laughs> so, but that, that really, I think, misses the point. Um, Understanding and comprehension makes you a better engineer. I think that's the way that I would say it, uh, rather than if you know what you're doing, you're better. So if we put this into context of Sensu, we want you to understand Sensu. And I think to do that, we need to maybe make it a little bit easier to understand Sensu. And so when I think about mechanical sympathy, I actually come at it from a different direction. I think that instead of us being sympathetic to the underlying hardware, the underlying system should be sympathetic to us. Humans and people should be at the center of design, at the center of software. We're building these things for people. Yes, there's software that we build that's specifically for machines, and we have to optimize for machines to communicate together more natively, more easily, more in, with better performance. 
But when you think of frameworks, frameworks are the things that we use to build things. And it's not, and I say we, right? Like people are using frameworks to build things. So human-centered design is this idea that at every single step of the way, at every point in the process of building something, you think about human interaction. You think about developer experience. You think about user experience in every decision that you make. So simply put, we want to make it easier. We want to make everything about Sensu easier. Development, installation, everything. How do we do that? How do we make things easier? Our first big thing that we want to change is operational complexity of Sensu. We are all Sensu users here, and I, I think we've all probably spent a considerable amount of time uh, operationalizing Sensu and making it something that's easy to use. And we, we just want to make that a little easier. And we'll talk about some of the ways that we're going to do that in just a second. We want to make it easier to integrate Sensu into other components of your infrastructure. Sensu shouldn't just be this like island of monitoring. Sensu should be a fundamental component of your infrastructure. It should be a thing that other things, other systems interact with. And we are, we're making metrics a first class citizen, as Sean and Caleb both mentioned. I meant to add a bullet point there. And we're going to go ahead and add multi tenancy and RBAC into open source Sensu because we understand that this is a challenge that everyone faces and we want to address that challenge. So, next up is why Go? First, why am I about to talk about Go? But also, why should anyone here care about Go? If we've made this commitment to not make you rewrite things in Go, why do you even need to know that we're using Go? I mean, ultimately, right? This is, I, I think, a, a good question worth, worth discussing. Human-centered design is like a, a core tenant of how Go is, is built. If you look at Go, and, and you look at the way the community works, if you look at the way the language works, at all the packaging, it, it's very focused on making it easier for people to do things with the language. So if we're going to take a human-centered design approach to Sensu 2.0, why not start with the language that it's written in? It thinks of people at every single step of the way. And even if you're not intending or never would contribute code to Sensu Core, I think it's worth just sort of understanding how this, even, even just us using Go, can, can make your life a little bit easier. There are four areas where I think Go just wins above any of the other options we really considered. Um, performance safety, packaging, and developer experience, again, going back to human-centered design. It is easier to write code in Go that performs well. It just is. It's a lot easier to do. Its concurrency primitives allow us to use, utilize multiple cores without actually having to do any extra work. If you compare this to Ruby's threading model, you actually have to do your own thread management. You have to schedule things onto threads. You have to make sure that you're sharing data safely between those threads. People have written entire libraries just to provide safe thread local storage in Ruby. And with Go, you just get that. This is just something that you have. This is built into the language. You don't have to think about threads, really. You do, I mean, again, we go back to mechanical sympathy, right? Like, if you know what you're doing, you can build better software. So we do understand how threads work in Go, but it's not something we have to think of at every step of the process. It just sort of happens in the background. Go is a compiled language. This is a, a pretty big deal because it means there is no overhead from dynamic dispatching. With dynamic languages, you have to do a whole lot of lookups into uh, you know, like tables that tell you, oh, this object is actually this thing, and this is where the code segment for that thing lives. With, with compiled languages, we have a, a much faster uh, access to this information, and these threads of execution just kind of seamlessly happen without any of that. There's no latency at runtime from compilation. Even if you're using a just-in-time compiler, like you still have to compile the first time you go through that code path. And this is just done up front. We get a lot of that cost out of the way. 
There's no global interpreter lock. Uh, I know it depends on what runtime you're using for Ruby. You can get some performance optimizations there. And in Java, even still in like threads in, in, the, in JRuby, there's still a gil, I think. So, oh, there's not. Oh, good to know, thanks. I actually never looked that up. I, I don't know anything about JRuby. Sean knows everything about JRuby. Uh, I don't have to know anything about JRuby because I'm rewriting Sensu and Go. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, whew. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no gil. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. And there's no VM or language that we have to ship around with Sensu. It's just a statically linked binary. And we'll still probably deliver that with packaging, but it, it's, it's much simpler packaging. And again, human-centered design. All of this comes because it's part of the language. It's not something we had to build. We didn't have to write a custom VM to do any of this. We didn't have to set up guardrails to do any of this. It just happens. Developer experience is the first thing about Go that every new engineer working in Go recognizes, I think, as being superb. Go makes it so easy for newcomers to start writing Go and being productive in Go. When we first started this about six months ago, uh, Simon Pallord and I were the only two people at Sensu that really had any practical experience in Go uh, for, for any considerable period of time. I've been using it for about the last three years. I built an entire product in Go, which ultimately failed, but that had nothing to do with Go. <laughs> It's mostly me. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, no, but, but my, my point is, even Sensu as newcomers to Go, we have been able to get up and running very quickly with Go. The other three engineers that have been contributing Go code to Sensu Go were committing to master in their first week. That's, that's fantastic to me. When I think about the jobs I've had in Ruby or in Clojure or Scala or anything, it takes a while to, sorry, it takes a while to figure out how people are doing things their way, right? Like they have set up these guardrails that you have to learn. They've built their own frameworks. They're using this rest thing. They're using that rest thing. And you have to learn all of this over and over again. And there's a little bit of that with Go, but really every project in Go looks really similar. And it's, I mean, it's boring. And I, I love the shit out of boring. <laughs> Good and boring are not mutually exclusive. Absolutely not. I want my day-to-day -day development experience to not be full of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this is possible because Go made it a priority to do this. The whole way they think, what, what, what is the human experience going to be like when we make this change? What, how are people going to interpret this documentation? Speaking of documentation, documentation's a language feature in Go. We can programmatically extract our comments from Sensu Go and use that to generate API documentation for you. We don't have to go write a Swagger spec by hand and do all of the documentation in there. We just translate Go source into documentation. So like, think of continuously, continuously delivered Sensu API documentation as opposed to it being a thing that people really have to devote energy into. Again, Go, not just for us, but also for users. And then safety, I think, is a big part of Go for me. There's a series of articles about why statically typed languages are better than, or are different than dynamically typed languages, and some of the qualities that make statically typed languages more uh, effective for engineers. Statically typed languages uh, serve as documentation. Your, your function definitions, the types associated to arguments, they facilitate easier documentation without you having to go and add the types to your documentation. There's, there's a lot there that just, again, humans don't have to do extra stuff to accomplish great things. Thread safety is really problematic in Ruby, as I said. And with Go, we just don't have to worry about it. It's concurrency primitives, get a lot of that out of the way. It's easier to write thread-safe code, easier to read, 
easier to refactor, easier to handle errors because the language was designed with humans in mind. Packaging gets a lot simpler in Sensu 2.0. There's no more Ruby Omnibus package, and I know that anybody that's ever built a Ruby Omnibus package, uh, for me, I have only done that uh, by watching other people build them, and I don't ever want to do it. So statically linked binaries in simple packages, lightweight, very small, no external dependencies, no, like, no package dependencies. That's really nice. Sensu becomes very isolated, and statically linked binaries mean it's easier to ship Sensu in a container, right? I, last time I looked, I think the Sensu 2.0 Go container on top of Alpine Linux was like maybe 75 megs. So you've got your whole operating system and everything you need to run a Sensu client and just like shim it into a Kubernetes pod or something. I don't know. To me, that was, that was super dope. Anyway, long story short, now that I'm done with my like Go lightning talk, uh, we've become really big fans of Go over the last six months. And it's really influenced the way we think about building Sensu 2.0. And that's why I, I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about Go for you know, 10 minutes, uh, because it's, it has really been a, a big benefit to us, uh, to our productivity, to our, it, it's been a shining example of what it's like to build something with users really in mind. So you get it, hopefully. <laughs> uh, that's a whole lot of stuff about why we chose Go. Please talk about Sensu 2.0. <laughs> wow, that totally looks dumb. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. It looked fine on my computer a minute ago. Uh, we want to make everything easier. Make everything easier. That's the thing that we're trying to do. Every time we make a decision, is this easier than the way that people used to do it? Without losing flexibility, without losing that, that sophistication that makes Sensu such a powerful framework for building monitoring tools. So how do we make everything easier? For me, the most important goal that we have with Sensu 2.0 is reducing operational burden and complexity. We want it to be easier for all of you, every current Sensu user, to get the most out of Sensu. And there's a lot of moving parts, and operationalizing those moving parts can be costly, right? And both in the form of resources, actual VMs or whatnot, but also in people, in the time it takes, and the effort you have to expend to build everything around Sensu. We want new organizations to be able to easily adopt Sensu, and some of that operational complexity can be a barrier to entry. If we can lower that barrier some, we get more people in the community, we get more users, we get more feedback, and, and it's just a big win if we can make this happen. And those barrier entries include things like RabbitMQ, real reliance on configuration management, high availability problems. It, these are all things that we've all solved over and over again. It's publicly documented. It's, it, it's become rote. We are able to do this and do it effectively, but what if it was easier? We want Sensu to be cost effective. We want you to realize your return on investment in Sensu as quickly as possible. So first up, there's no more RabbitMQ. I think a couple of people have mentioned this earlier. It's gone. And we have moved the entire transport into Sensu. RabbitMQ did a lot of really fantastic things for Sensu 1.0. Uh, it was already a popular, battle-proven piece of software when Sensu 1.0 was written. It used AMQP, which is like the gold standard for messaging protocols at this point, if you ask me. And we learned a lot from our experience using RabbitMQ. All of us did. I, I think that it, for me at least, it definitely changed the way I thought about PubSub. And we've, we've kept that knowledge in Sensu 2.0. We're not just throwing that away. PubSub is still at the heart of Sensu 2.0 and how the transport works. So what we're doing is we're utilizing web sockets so that we get that bi-directional streaming from client to server. Uh, it's a framed protocol, so we don't have to like manage our message passing. We don't have to write a protocol to talk between Sensu client and server. One of the key differences in how the AMQP protocol and how WebSockets work is 
AMQP is, is typed. It's kind of like proto buffers, actually. Uh, you have field identifiers, type identifiers, and it, it's very well organized. Whereas with WebSockets, everything is just binary or ASCII. So we're using binary encoding in the WebSockets because we want to avoid, like ASCII is actually, how it's not even ASCII, it's UTF-8. And herein lies the problem with using text for WebSocket messages in Sensu 2.0 is we're just bypassing encoding entirely by using binary messages in WebSockets. And that's a big deal. This is, this is a big win for us. It's still just JSON messages under the hood, but there's no more intermediate broker. There's no more, I have to operation, operationalize and run RabbitMQ to run Sensu. There's no more Redis. Redis served us very well for a very long time. I think it's still going to serve everyone very well for a very long time. But our needs from our storage in Sensu 2.0 have changed fairly dramatically. We need something that's better at consistent, durable storage. We need something that the solution to problems with storage is not rebuild every, like rebuild all the state. Like if you think of what Rabbit or, or Redis does in Sensu 1.0, you think of it as this like ephemeral data store. Any one of us can lose everything that's in Redis and within a few minutes, the whole state is built back up. And that's, uh, mostly, and, and that's fine, right? Like it's, it's not the end of the world if you lose Redis. But we're doing things with storage in Sensu 2.0 that mean we need, we need persistence out of our storage. And even when you're doing like HA Redis and RabbitMQ well, like sometimes this is how it feels because you're like juggling HA Redis instances with Redis Sentinel or like a RabbitMQ node crashes and you're like, well, it's time to RMRF varlib RabbitMQ. I'm sure no one in here has ever typed that command. <laughs> but all we want is, we just want you to have to think about, if you're using Sensu, we just want you to have to think about Sensu, right? Like not two other products. So Redis is being replaced by etcd. etcd is a high performance, distributed, NoSQL key value store. It's commercially supported by CoreOS and a healthy community of developers. I've met quite a few of them. They're fantastic people. I, I love the CoreOS folks. Uh, they've been a real blessing to work with behind the scenes and like ask questions about etcd and, and how they've done gRPC stuff in it. And they've, they've really assuaged a lot of my concerns over the years about, about really relying on etcd as a core component of a product, which I've done before now. Uh, and so have others like CoreOS, CoreOS Container Linux, totally on top of etcd, Kubernetes, totally on top of etcd. And a big part of how they do that is they want you to think of etcd as an implementation detail. And we would like you to do that as well. So we're actually embedding etcd directly into Sensu. You're gonna manage Sensu 2.0 clusters a lot like you manage etcd clusters. And one of my like fun side projects right now is CoreOS has an etcd operator that allows you to just have an etcd resource on a Kubernetes cluster. So we're gonna just have a Sensu operator that's a fork of that because you run it just like etcd and you have a Sensu operator. So you just have Sensu running on Kubernetes. That's exciting. <laughs> So all of, our, all of your configuration is now stored, and state is now stored inside of etcd. And etcd is responsible for replicating all of that configuration between your Sensu hosts. And we're gonna talk about what that means in just a second. Uh, but besides that, DR and HA, so all of your disaster recovery stuff, all of your high availability stuff is now baked into Sensu 2.0 because you can lose a little bit less than half of your Sensu cluster, and you still have high available Sensu with Quorum, so you can still make changes, you still have availability, and you're still up and running. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's an exciting and compelling thing, uh, a reason why I, we decided to use etcd as our, our data store. 
Another big pillar of Sensu Wandado has been configuration management and its friendship with configuration management. And I'm happy to say you no longer need any configuration management at all. Just kidding. <laughs> In Sensu 1.0, configuration management did a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And it, it makes sense because it was built to work with configuration management. It was intended to do all the heavy lifting for us. In general, CM is responsible for everything in Sensu 1.0. An encouraging and compelling story that I have seen from people today and that I hear a lot is we've put effort into building sane inf interfaces to Sensu in configuration management. And that's really exciting because it, you know, it lowers the barrier to entry for your users, your engineer, engineering cohort to use Sensu. And that's, that's really exciting to see uh, because you know, if, you're, if you're putting a tool like Sensu out there, if you're trying to evangelize monitoring in your organization, it needs to be very easy for people to adopt those practices. So we, as in Sensu, would like to make it easier for you to empower your fellow engineers in your organizations to more easily adopt monitoring, adopt Sensu. So we want to make Sensu 2.0 less reliant on configuration management. Deploying software in general will always be easier with something like CM or a scheduler like Kubernetes, Mesos, whatever. You're always going to have frameworks to get the software out there. But we want CM to do less on every host for Sensu. Like if you think about changing, like rolling out a new version of a check on every host that it runs on, you're running CM in production on all of those machines in order to do that. And we'd like that to not have to be the case. We would like it so that you just interact with Sensu and those changes get propagated out to your infrastructure. Theoretically, you could run Sensu 2.0 without any configuration management whatsoever. Uh, if you think about an AMI, right? Uh, bake Sensu into your AMI, throw its configuration and cloud in it. Like if you've ever used CoreOS, or any, anything with cloud in it actually, you can configure the way that services start up. You can throw files onto disk. Uh, you could just run Sensu 2.0 with cloud in it and AMIs. And just manage everything via the Sensu 2.0 API, which is another really exciting feature about Sensu 2.0. Another big responsibility that Sensu or that CM did or had for Sensu 1.0 is managing uh, checks, right? Again, uh, all of your plugins need to be shipped to servers. In Sensu 2.0, we're going to have these things called assets, which are really just super simple packages. They're zipped tarballs with a special directory format. And we're working on tooling to make it really trivial to create these. Again, built into the, a small command line utility. You just bundle everything you need into a special directory structure, put it in S3 or whatever static asset storage and serv serving uh, whatever, like HTTP server, whatever you have. Uh, and Sensu is just going to download that for you. You're going to say, for my web service check, I use a Ruby runtime, and I use check HTTP.rb. And we are going to go pull versioned assets from an external URL for you, expand those on disk in a special environment, set up the runtime environment for that check, and then execute the check for you, all without having to do anything in configuration management, without having to install Ruby, without having to install any packages. It just happens. And that's, that's, that's big to me. Um, that's a, a very exciting and compelling feature that, again, just makes it easier for you to do stuff with Sensu. Again, getting configuration management kind of out of the way a little bit. And I think the reason I, I, I personally am interested in doing that is there's a hidden cost to configuration management that we don't really think about a lot. It's fairly common that we go out and we build these, these interfaces to Sensu and CM, and we have to spend all this time doing it, and even still we have to evangelize it and train people to use it. We have to review pull requests. Well, what if we didn't ever have to do any of that? And 
the way that we do that is by being really API focused in Sensu 2.0. We want everything as much as possible to happen through the API. This doesn't mean that you can't configure Sensu using configuration management. You can use services from within a configuration management using custom resources and using client libraries to those services to control resources with CM. But that shouldn't have to be the case. And I, I want to talk about why that's personally very exciting to me. I've been doing ops, uh, systems engineering, DevOps, whatever you want to call it, for the better part of 17 years. Uh, it was what I have done from the very beginning as a system administrator to today, still doing it, will always do it. And during that time, I have never been on an ops whatever team or interacted with one as a software engineer that just was not slammed. And I mean, it just really had too much to do. And even until the last few years, I've never actually, or had never been on a team whose sprint schedule and priorities weren't dictated by every other team in an organization but mine. We'd like it to, we just, we want to make that a little bit more of a reality for, for, for ops people and, and, and DevOps engineers because if we can build Sensu in a way that just makes it a little bit easier, again, for your users to use Sensu, that means you're doing a less toilsome work. You're, just, you're not doing as much of the day-to-day the -day operation of it. We want Sensu to be thought of as a building block in infrastructure. And if Sensu has a good enough API, a, a robust enough API, that's gonna be a lot easier for, for us to make happen. We've talked a lot about self-service monitoring today. We don't wanna just continue to make that possible. It should just, it should just be how people think of Sensu when they see Sensu. Like if it's already monitoring as a service without having, you, without having to build monitoring as a service on top of Sensu, like that, that's a paradigm shift in how people think about monitoring even, not just Sensu. And that's, that's really exciting. Again, I'm just a really excitable person. <laughs> and if Sensu is API driven, it means that you can interact more easily and quickly and readily with Sensu via the API. And it can, it can be a part of this new trend of API driven infrastructure, right? We really, we want to naturally fit into a stack that looks like this. Sorry, Jason. And again, if you think about machines interacting with machines, that's like another user interface, right? So now we have like a dashboard, we have you know, the API, all of these are interfaces, and this means that we can build things like this, Sensu Cuddle. So this is the Sensu CLI that we have right now, and this is one of uh, James's amazing GIFs, animated GIFs that he pull, puts on all of his pull requests to the Sensu, to Sensu Cuddle. And I mean, it's just a statically linked Go binary, and we build it with the Sensu code itself using client library that we have in there. And this is just a part. Yeah, this is, this is not, this is not, uh, yeah, check full. Or this would be like, Sean was talking about the, um, the remediation stuff that you can build now, like rm-rf slash, rm-rf var logs. <laughs> I mean, that's, I'm just gonna put that into like Sensu plugins somewhere tonight in a drunken pull request. <laughs> so speaking of multiple interfaces, uh, last year I gave a talk at Monitorama called Monitoring is Dead. Uh, and the title was meant as a joke because all anybody was talking about at the time is observability. But what's observability without the all-seeing observer, right? Monitoring's alive and well, and I want to make sure that we are all building the best monitoring products that we can by providing you, by Sensu providing you with a better framework to do so. In that talk, I mentioned a Sensu, well, a monitoring, monitoring .yaml file because I wasn't working at Sensu at the time. I was working for another monitoring company that again failed, built a product on Go, had me as its CTO. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> none of that was why it failed. None of that was why it failed. Um, again, it's fine. Uh, what if this was just in the root of your VCS repo? What if this was how people interacted with monitoring for their projects? What if they'd had a Travis YAML for monitoring? 
having an API-driven product makes that, I mean, almost trivial. It becomes thought of as being something that interacts with your CI-CD pipeline instead of having to build that shim, uh, to steal Kyle's word. It's, I, I mean, I, everybody uses the word shim, but it'll just be a, a theme or something for the day. If you think about it, like you can build higher order workflows and applications on top of Sensu if it's this API-driven framework, like part of your CI-CD pipeline. And I personally told Caleb and Sean that like this is table stakes for me. Like we, if we don't have a native story for Sensu on Kubernetes, like this is not even worth doing for me. And if, if we can't just make this a th the way that people think about Sensu, this is not worth doing. And so that's been really like a driving factor for me every single week. Another big thing I want to talk about real fast is time series data. We want to make metrics a key part of your monitoring strategy. We understand that metrics are, are really important. Observability is a thing. We want to make it easier for you to get numerical data about your application's performances through your monitoring pipeline into time series databases. And we want to make it easier for you to incorporate that data in your Sensu checks. So we're going to work on integrations with time series databases so that we're not having to continue to rebuild the wizard vans, the graphite relays of the world, and instead it's just part of Sensu Go. It's just something that's there. And you can compose these... Anyway, I'm not going to get into anything super exciting. You'll have to talk to me after I've had a few drinks, but... <laughs> We, we've got some really cool things in mind for what we want to do with Sensu 2.0 and metrics, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm really stoked to build it and to talk to you and work with the community uh, to make metrics just really a core component of monitoring. Again, our back in multi-tenancy, just part of Sensu 2.0. I think that this is a thing that a lot of us have built. We've gotten good at it. And we've seen today, people have these really rich experiences for deploying Sensu to make multi-tenant monitoring as a service happen in your, in your uh, organizations. And this is just a problem that needs to be solved for Sensu. So we looked at things like IAM, and we, we looked at things like Kubernetes, and we said, you know, what are, the, what are they doing to make multi-tenancy and role-based access control uh, powerful and flexible. And so we're trying to take some of what we think are the best components of that and kind of put them into our back and multi-tenancy for Sensu. So we've taken namespaces from Kubernetes and, and GCE, and we're going to kind of use this top-level organization as, as your, your highest namespace in Sensu. And so you could have many of these for business units, for teams, for divisions, for whatever uh, you know, subcategory of people you have in your organization. We're going to make it easier for you to just, you know, cut up your Sensu clusters, hand bits of them out to people, and really have a good multi-tenant service for monitoring. So how do we get there? Again, we'll just full circle with Caleb's talk. We'll use this GIF again, because you can never get enough of it. At least I can't. Um, the nice thing about a rewrite is a lot of the product road mapping is done. We know you like Sensu. We know what you like about it, what you don't. So all we need to do is take that and just start building. And this is a lot of what it's like. And it's going to be more fun to do this once we start involving community members in the alpha, because we'll be able to just continue to build, check in with people with the alpha. What do you think? Give us some feedback. Go back to building, look up. Go back to building, look up. We've done most of the heavy lifting for Sensu 2.0 already. During the alpha, we're hoping to finish the Sensu 1.0 feature set, get it into Sensu 2.0, get it into the hands of as many users as we can, get good feedback, and again, just make things easier for everybody. Um, and now, Sensu has the full force of a company behind it. And that's a big deal. It's not somebody's side project. It's not like 
your weekends that makes Sensu great. It's a dedicated team of engineers whose only job is to work on Sensu. And I'm really, really happy to be part of that team. So I, again, I just, I'm really excited to be here. It is so amazing to see everybody here. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to find me, if you want to talk to me tonight, my DMs are open. So if, if you don't feel comfortable like interacting with humans, I might not at some point tonight. Um, but yeah, just find me, talk to me. Let's talk about Sensu. Uh, let's talk about how we can make this amazing. <laughs>